Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Brock and Bay Chronicles. My name's Keith. Thanks for joining us as Andy continues his first time reading of Worm by Wild Bo. Today, he's seeking the answer to the question, can a teenage warlord and her friends once again rise to the occasion and save their hometown from disaster? Andy, what's up? How you doing? I'm doing pretty well, but that is a, a tricky question thrown in there that the warlord is also blind. Well, there's that. Complicates things. So this could be the biggest challenge yet. Today, we're going to be reviewing Arc 18, Queen, Chapter 6 and 7, and the third interlude. And as far as new business, Tony is coming back for a, a second session, joining us for Part 4. And we have some questions and comments. Yes, we got a one question and one comment from a couple of our regular contributors. First up is a comment from Johannes E. Johannes says, the creation of minions is explicitly a master power, one of the more common, in fact, though the exact nature of the power has endless variations. And that's to the confirmation of the what I had got confused about about uh, the powers for Skitter and Bitch, and uh, I think I might have been thinking of a couple of other people. Mm. Do you remember who else was part of that conversation? might have been Noel. I think we were thinking of Noel, yeah, and mm -hmm. how it was kind of swarm versus swarm, possibly, we were right. looking at. Right. So thanks, uh, Johannes. We're always counting on fo knowledgeable folks like you to help us uh, stay on the straight and narrow. Next, we hear from Megafire 7. The Undersiders are playing a dangerous game during this crisis. Do you expect anyone to try to betray them as things unfold? Do you expect them to betray anyone else? If so, who? What do you think, Andy? Well, I was considering this question, and in relation to what we're going to be talking about through this session and Eidolon and how he's doing. I mean, he's pulling a little bit of an arms master here. You know, he's kind of, it's not for the same reason. It's not for popularity or, or political power, but just to try to see if he can jumpstart, if he can tap into stuff. And so he's, he's intentionally putting people at risk, even though he doesn't think it's, he thinks there's still going to be a way out if he fails, but, but I could see something when I was thinking of this question, almost like one of my old favorite fantasy books, uh, which was a, a character named Elric mm -hmm. by Michael Moorcock. And he had this magical sword that actually had an evil soul inside of it called Stormbringer. And once he kind of unleashed that sword, it would get it would have an insatiable hunger to try to just kill. And so he became like the ultimate berserker and he didn't, the, the sword for sure didn't care, but Elric would get to, cause there was a feedback thing mm -hmm. where he didn't care if he was killing enemies or friends. And so his friends always kind of had to keep one eye on him, you know, to see if he was losing it and then just bolt you know, <laughs> like, all right, we're going to have to let him take care of this. So I could foresee something similar to Eidolon where say he taps into it and it, but it also lowers his inhibitions kind of, or he just, ah. he, he, he just can't control the power and he just starts going nuclear almost um, and just start, or he thinks if I just had a little more, if I just was, you know, a little bit more pushed to the edge, then I would, I would get that tap into that new thing. And so I'll fight the undersiders uh -huh. And maybe they can push me far enough to to tap in. I don't know. I'm big speculation there. Hmm. There is a question in here. Let me see. There's a skitter related question in here that I'm I'm not able to formulate. Maybe as we get into the episode, maybe I can have it kind of coalesce in my brain. Um, okay, cool. Uh Thanks, everyone, for your contributions. And to any of you new listeners, folks who are just joining us, please feel free to throw some questions our way. We are always glad to have the uh, the input. 
And with those two items done, we are going to move on into our review, starting off Queen, Arc 18, Chapter 6. And we're picking up with the squad. Um, they're just engaged the Vistas, and they get a surprise from them. Tattletail yells at Skitter to toss away her armband as she was on uh, just on communicating with Miss Militia, Miss Militia, letting her know they had engaged the enemy. Turns out one of the Vistas has a pretty devastating power. Each one of these clones, as we knew, would have some unique powers, some a different power set than the original Vista. Pretty scary going up against these guys. Well, yeah, these are mutated powers, right? So mm -hmm. not only are they unpredictable, but generally they're going to be awful. <laughs> and yeah. so... Uh, yeah, as it turns out, as this one Vista clone is dissolving things, they become radioactive or the radioactivity causes the dissolving. Hard to hard to say how that's mixed together, but luckily Tattletail kind of picks up on that and nobody's hair starts falling out instantly. Yes, and she has Gru throw his darkness over it. And this is kind of a callback to something way back, if I'm not mistaken when Taylor first joined the squad and they were sharing power sets and what mm. they thought they did. And you recall if, uh, if you recall Tattletail speculated then about whether or not Gru's darkness could hamper radiation. And so she says, Hey, I'm kind of making an educated guess here, but I I'm pretty sure if you see if whatever that one dissolves, you throw some darkness on it and it should quell the radiation. It's it's better than nothing, I guess. Yeah, definitely his power seems to dampen any kind of wavelength, you know, and, and light is a kind of radiation. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it, it makes sense. This is obviously much more intense and negative aspects are, are a lot worse, but it's worth a shot. Yeah. Regent's comment early on in this, in this uh, chapter doesn't matter, does it? Regent said, the world's ending in a few years. Getting to be kind of a refrain with him, yeah? Yeah, but I I can, I mean, I definitely can relate. You know, it's, uh, it's kind of got to be something that's gnawing in the back of everybody's mind. Mm -hmm. And based on Regent's background, he probably felt like, there was a certain hopelessness to his situation from a very young age, you know, that he was predestined to follow in his father's footsteps and, and do all these kind of similar horrible things or be forced to do them or coerced into doing them. And so, you know, he's kind of, his brain is already kind of in that mode, fatalistic mode. And so it makes sense that he keeps kind of coming back around to that. So as we're moving on a little bit further in, the Undersiders and the Wards dispatch this first set of Vistas. It's not an easy thing. Skitter's got her bugs out searching for weaknesses on them. The skin on one of them is extremely uh, tough. They, she can't get any kind of penetration. As soon as they engage this radiation one, a second Vista shows up and joins the fight. The Chicago Wards... Raymancer, Tecton, we get some some cool displays. How about Grace? That nice combo attack between her and Tecton where he, he launched her toward the roof. Pretty cool. Yeah, that, that was reminiscent of some of the great kind of tag teams of DC and Marvel, mm -hmm. you know, where it's uh, like cloak and dagger kind of thing. You know, it's people that are very complimentary and have, have found ways to work together well. So that was pretty cool. So not exactly, well, not flight at all, but a certain level of, in, pardon me, invincibility that allowed her to come off of his pile driving gloves, even though her attack was, her attempted attack was thrown off by one of the Vista's powers. She landed hard, but landed safely. And in a moment later was again, heading toward her target. I'll keep coming back to it. Wild Bo displaying just this vivid imagination and the different mm. power sets that he gives these these uh, capes, even ones with similar 
similar abilities, they are unique enough to to capture your imagination, I think. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's that's a great point. Uh, and that's got to be a, a huge challenge in this type of thing. You know, it's one thing to look at all the birds that are around or all the different plants, you know, and be able to say, oh, well, yeah, this this is this plant has this kind of fruit. This one has nuts. This mm-hmm. one has just leaves or whatever. But to be coming up with that on your own and then trying to differentiate enough that you keep people from thinking, oh, yeah, no, that's just a clone of that other one. Right. That is pretty amazing. Raymancer gets hit. This uh, was a very sad event that happened. The Radiation Vista was able to uh, throw a diversion and then attack using some of the material from one of the, from the PRT van they were they had been riding in, and he catches a what is probably a lethal dose of radiation to the face. This is a life and death struggle. This is the real deal for these teenagers. And as we'll see in the interlude, it's easy to forget that, but it's taken a huge toll. And it's not just that, all right, we've got this big battle, but that the whole area is already kind of a giant cesspool anyway, you know, and that they're trying to dig out from the ashes, so to speak. And it's just like, oh, great. Here's some more buildings get turned down. Oh, and some radiations get thrown around that. We didn't have that one on the bingo card. So let's let's add that in. So instead of just going to high school and worrying about uh, whether you're going to be starting the big game on Friday or not. Now you're thinking, oh, well, I'll probably die today. Well, that's, yeah. that's not so cool. The Undersiders. Well, on the one hand, we get a pretty good display of their lethality as a unit. And we do, during the course of these two chapters, uh, chapter six and seven, we get field commander Skitter in all her glory. But at no point, at least not from for me, at no point did they come across as bloodthirsty, I don't think. Skitter is kind of revolted by the, uh, and I think it's a little further, or in the next chapter, I forget, She's kind of revolted when um, she has to have her insects kill or bleed out one of the vistas. Rachel, we have um, Bentley crushing the first one that they attacked. From Skitter's description, it doesn't sound like Rachel did when she was sending her dogs against Leviathan in, in the Inbringer attack. It was kind of a, a nonchalant, well, not nonchalant, but just a kill order, and that was that pack up and move on it wasn't a bloodthirsty killer killer kind of thing right yeah no they they are definitely kind of surgical they're trying to just they know they can't afford to get caught up in the emotions or the brutality or whatever you know that they need to just all right we got we got a bunch of stuff that could be going on here we don't know how many of these more are coming down the pike there could be more every minute let's just take care of this and move on and I think some of it probably is that, you know, that they're clones. So, right. you know, it's 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 like when you're playing, a, when our kids were smaller, we didn't want them to play video games necessarily that were too brutal, mm-hmm. too, uh, too violent. But if they were, you know, blowing up robots or something, it wasn't quite as bad or it was, it was cartoony, you know. And so right. I think you got the idea here that these aren't really people. We hope they're not anyway. It'd be horrible for them to be people and be on the inside of that. But I think that they're the, the thing that the Wild Bull does is give enough hesitation in Skitter's reaction to killing them that um that it doesn't seem like she's glorifying the act of ending their existence, even though they are perverse copies of mm-hmm. of Vista. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, these are just kind of uh kind of zombie cannon fodder if you will, mm-hmm. you know. It's like mm-hmm. you just got to get through this there, but gotcha. you're almost put them up put them out of their misery a little bit. Is kind of the the sense I get. Or maybe maybe I'm projecting a little bit, but I just can't imagine that they are they're super happy about what's going on. Mm-hmm. The clones that is. So after they dispatch these guys 
they call for some aid, some radiation treatment for for poor Ray Mancer. Miss Militia tells them to stand by. They'll get some decontamination equipment to him as soon as possible. We do get a display of Wanton's power, and he is able to deal with the radiation to an extent. And using his power, he's able to pulverize one of the one of the vistas. So with the additions of the, the Chicago wards and Skitter's leadership, they make pretty quick work of these guys. Tattletale says to Wanton, and see, sometimes I do have trouble with Tattletale. She's a little bit insensitive to the situation with Raymancer, not Wanton. I apologize. Um, in the, uh, yeah, you're probably going to die kind of nonchalant thing. Did you have any trouble with that? Um, not, not too much. You know, again, it's, it's just that kind of fatalistic vibe that's going on. You know, there's, mm. it's almost like the, the comment before Leviathan showed up, you know, that, uh, all right. Statistics show that this many people are going to go down or this percentage. So yeah, that's it's true. just like, yeah, it's just kind of a given. And, you know, Noel is a junior end bringer. So uh, you got to figure some people are going to be in their final roundup, so to speak. Let's see here. I don't know if I have mentioned where I was at this point in the story. You know, I was all in on Skitter turning and becoming a good guy earlier on. And it took me a while to get to accept the fact that she is a villain. Once the story turned and she went toward villainy, I was disappointed in the character or in disappointed in where the story was taking the character. Yeah. We, we de- you know, I think all of us were kind of brought up with the same thing. And I think it's it's part of this, just being in this country, you know, where we have so much prosperity and generally things go the right direction. Mm-hmm. That it's it's very two sides of a coin. You know, you're either a good guy or you're a bad guy. There's very few that are kind of in the middle or straddling. And so I think it's natural to to hope that the the main character is going to be a hero. And I think I I kind of find it a little refreshing. This is a little more real world to me, mm-hmm. I guess, even though it's it's obviously a totally phantasmagorical world. But just the idea that, you know, rarely are are things so cut dried. And as we proceed through life, the choices we make start to kind of frame who we are or. They, they accrete around us and we we kind of say, all right, well, out of the last 10 decisions I did, I went this way eight times, so I'm going to keep going that way. That, that went okay. Mm-hmm. And I think we've talked about a few times how crossing a line tends to make it easier to cross that line again. And, you know, it's it can often be easy to find justifications for things while, oh, I'm doing this because of that. I'm protecting these folks or trying to save this person. You see that in, uh, you see that in, in Skitter. Yeah. She's, she's yeah, crossing definitely. lines. Oh yeah. And I think we've talked about that a number of times where, mm-hmm. you know, I think she was totally horrified with happened to long at the beginning. Didn't realize how things could go that way. But then a little while later, you know, she realizes, Oh, I better carve out his eyes because <laughs> I don't want him to see, and and he can regenerate anyway, so he'll be all right. So once folks get over that certain thing, it it can be a little easier the next time. Is Wild Bull numbed us to this um, this escalation in violence from from this girl? Yeah, maybe a little bit, but I don't think it it reminds me of any kind of post-apocalyptic story in that sense where book of Eli or whatever, mm, where, mm-hmm. all right, there's ash falling all the time. There's nothing to eat. There's nothing to drink. So the dude's 
sitting there patiently for hours until he can shoot the scrawny cat with a bow and arrow. Right. And then, you know, he's eating that and making chapstick out of the fat. Mm-hmm. You know, you if you think about, wow, my lips are kind of dry. I think, oh, there's a stray cat. You know, nobody thinks that way, right? Because <laughs> right. you just go to Rite Aid and you buy a chapstick. <laughs> but when the world's falling around you, falling apart, then uh, then kind of all bets are off, you know. And, and all of a sudden, Rite Aid doesn't have chapstick anymore. Rite Aid's not even there anymore. Mm-hmm. It's, a, it's a smoking crater, and there's a bunch of bad stuff going on in there. So... We do kind of come become numb to it, but it's it's like you're in a war zone, you know. It's just like watching Band of Brothers or something, you know, where it's just mm. you do what you got to do to to survive. Exactly, yeah, and and that changes the kind of ethics and morality equation a little bit, you know. It's like, oh well, did you try this? That wasn't even an option. Okay, I'll go through this list of ten things. None of those were options. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, 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 instead I did this and I'm like, Oh wow, that's grim. Well, I was pretty much out of all options. Yeah. I hear you. Uh, so decontamination stuff is going to be on the way. Tecton has to make a tough decision and leave his teammate, but, uh, Wanton is going to stay with Ray Manser until help arrives. And so difficult as it is for a leader to leave his team, um, he and Grace hop in the uh, the containment van with Tattletail and the rest of them, and they head on off. Grace was the throughout this, even leaping a further head. She was I don't know if you want to call her difficult or obstinate or the voice of reason. How did you see her? Even um, skipping ahead into some of the decisions that were made in Chapter Seven, how did you see Grace as a character? Um, maybe a little bit. Although they're going to apply the same description to Skitter a little bit later, but she seems a little naive and trying to maintain things. I'm trying to think of, well, like referring back to the the book of Eli, you know, obviously the world's falling apart, but then he gets to this town and there's this one warlord guy who's still trying to, you know, eat on nice China plates and, mm-hmm. And you're just like, uh, oh, dude, this is just not, you got to realize this isn't how the world is anymore. Yeah. And so I kind of admire her for wanting to try to maintain her, her stance, if you will. But I also, I'm kind of like, now oh, might be better if you just devoted that energy to helping to get stuff done. So as the team moves on, it's Dragon's AI that comes across the armband first and says they've got a sighting of Noel and orders all the capes to stand down. Once again, Tattletail is not down for this, and she's like, why? And um, word comes back that Eidolon has found Noel and wants to engage her by himself. That's not what comes across, but he's requested that everybody stand down. This goes to what you were talking about uh, regarding his agenda in this uh, situation. We go into the, when we get to the interlude, we find out uh, what his, his agenda is. Tattletail's power is cluing her in. And this is where Grace is like, hey, this is Idolin. He's one of the good guys. Of course, he knows what he's doing. You know, you guys, uh, how does she put it? Is this what you guys do? You, you twist the situation until uh, you have to act kind of thing and they're like well who was the regent said yeah and we're really good at it too when you're used to fighting as a group and you know you kind of augment each other and based on like i said earlier what arms master kind of did you know it's kind of like well no that we know how bad this can be we should be bringing in everyone and everything that we can to try to stop this. And so I'm sure there's part of them that wants to believe that Eidolon knows what he's doing, but Mm -hmm. these aren't, you know, just wet behind the ear kids anymore. They've gone up against the nine and Leviathan and they're like, yeah, we've seen how, how bad it can be and how people can think they're all okay with how things are going to go. And then 
Next thing you know, they got a spike sticking out of the, from the back, you know. So it's a tough call. You know, you want to you wanna believe what he, he knows what he's doing. But history has taught them that it's better to come in blazing away than just trust in the sniper being able to solve the problem. Yeah. And Skitter and Tattletail both are looking at the clock and realizing mm-hmm. that Don is approaching and Tattletail radios or attempts to radio into Miss Militia and remind her that this is where Dinah said things were going to go south right at sunrise. And so uh, here you have Idolin in close quarters with Noel. You've got that prediction from Dinah hanging over your head. And so your first thought has to be what? What did you think? Well, I, I'm i with what uh, what they said here, deranged mutant Eidolons. Mm-hmm. How much worse <laughs> is that going to be, you know? <laughs> so I'm thinking that Eidolon's going to have some kind of thing that happens where he underestimates something, and, and then next thing you know, it's worst-case scenario for everybody. Yep, could be. The the undersiders say, look, uh, we've got to get in there to try to make to try to be back up in case something goes south with this guy. Grace, again, this is where she's kind of saying, look, you, no, I don't want to do deal with this. Tecton lays out the reasons for why he feels it actually makes sense to go with the undersiders. And he's pr- he's pretty sound in his judgment. Grace is not happy, but hops in the van and the team heads on down the road. Once Skitter is able to get bugs in the area, she discovers that the two of them are talking and every time she puts bugs on Noel to try to assess her f- physical appearance, they disappear into Noel. She loses contact with them. And uh, as we're moving toward the end of the end of the chapter, she's uh, doing laying out the mental map with her bugs of the, the situation. She says, she says, uh, Idolin's voice was calm, quiet, in stark contrast to the hot breath that billowed around Noel as she panted with no less than five mouths. Ugh. Yeah, right. I mean, I'm I'm getting Cthulhu visions here. You know, it's just the uh, the gibbering mass or whatever it was. You know, it's it's pretty grim. <laughs> definitely. And then the final uh, the final couple of lines from the from the chapter are. I only caught two words as he spoke to her. Coil was one and Cauldron was another. Mm. Yeah. And that moves us on into the interlude. Bonus interlude number three, Jessica Yamada, therapist. And before we dig into this, for those of you who are unaware of the Worm audiobook project, this was this interlude where they did a full cast reading of this interlude and it's fantastic. It was their first attempt at doing this. As everyone knows, if, if you've been with our podcast for a while, you know, I love the audio book that these guys mm. did and they did a full cast reading and it's fantastic. And you can find it on Spotify or on their website. I think we've got a link down in the description of our, of our video here. So again, Starting off, you have no idea what this is all about until you do. How did you like the intro? And uh, did it take you very long to figure out what was going on? Once I got to the second person, I, I kind of was pretty sure what was going on. But as as the the lady's talking and you realize that it's Victoria and she can't speak, Mm-hmm. she's blinking and stuff then you're like oh okay and then you know they mention that uh oh she's in the bird cage and and then you know victoria gets more upset and you know that well no that's what she wanted to do and so i i realized that somebody was trying to help victoria and process mm-hmm. through things but it wasn't for a while until i realized oh she's going through a whole whole bunch of different people and it kind of reminded me of 
the the Watchmen uh, comic book where there's a therapist that talks to Rorschach a few times and he thinks he's he's helping and he feels like things are going well but it keeps showing what's going through Rorschach's mind as he's saying all these these bogus things you know and there's all these horrible images flashing through his mind he's just totally not sharing anything with the guy so yeah the only reference i have for that would be the movie you read the 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 graphic novel so i presume it's much more detailed than what was shown in the movie yeah yeah so the rorschach obviously is that test where you're shown abstract images and then you try to how you describe what you see gives the therapist some indication of your mental state and so it would show Rorschach seeing a picture of a, a thing that looked remarkably like a butterfly, but in his vision, it was a, a dead dog with its head split open and the brains coming out. And you're like, uh, and he's like, Oh, it's a butterfly. You're like, he is totally snowing this guy. That is so uncool, but he didn't let anything through, but the therapist was like, Oh yeah. And so I think if in Jessica's case here, it's just it's just really hard uh, and and uh you know one of the therapy sessions kind of touches on it at the at the last one there um or the second to last one i guess how did you like this as we follow jessica through her various uh, meetings with her, her patients and we get the timeline the events someone comes in and this event Mm. had happened and the next she meets with the next uh, ward and that event had happened how did you like that as a as a tool for adding in to and uh, fleshing out the story well I, i thought it was really cool in a couple of ways one was it really showed how kind of what we were talking about earlier that there's a bit of a fatality undertone in a lot of this and mm-hmm. People are just really kind of in despair almost for the most part. I mean, kid win was a little bit different, but I think that highlights how different people process things. You know, some people feel like they're going to be okay or the world's going to be okay. And then other people are just like, wow, this is so messed up. And they're really focused more on that. But yeah, the second thing was that it made you realize that, there's another dimension, you know, that these, these folks aren't just like sitting around twiddling their thumbs or doing training until, you know, the alarm goes off and they put on their suits and zoom away, you know, that folks are trying to support them. They're trying to, to help things. They know things are bad, but they're also, the resources are pretty scant. And so that makes it difficult. And they, there's almost a fatalistic feeling from the therapist as well that you know i don't i can't really understand what they're going through and i've got to try to just help them as as much as i can but i just feel like i'm not helping much at all jessica is a very well written character and she's the character at this at a at this point in the story that i didn't realize i wanted to meet until i met her kind of thing hmm yeah, I, I think that's that's a great way to put it because we all have in the back of our minds as readers that these folks are going through the meat grinder and it's got to be very unpleasant and and you know lead to despair in a lot of cases. But here you have somebody that's actually kind of bringing that out and showing it in a way that's it's not just like a, a Shakespearean soliloquy where. Mm-hmm. somebody is standing alone in the corner talking to themselves. This is something that a, a normal is, is trying to help a parahuman or help them process anyway, and starting to realize how large the gap is between them and that it's got to be sobering, you know, as yeah. a normal, you're thinking, Oh, the parahumans probably feel like this is under control. And you find out, no, they think it's pretty bad. That like, Oh, well, if you all think it's bad, then I'm like a fly with the the swatter about to come down. You know, I <laughs> sure I got no shot. Hey, let me ask you this. And uh, you know, if if you think this is an unfair question, feel free to say so. So this 
with the exception of Idolin, this entire thing is dealing with ward aged kids, if not, you know, members of the ward team. Do you right. think this could have been as interesting if Jessica had been dealing with uh, with mainline heroes, adults, rather than um, the these teenage kids? Do you think it could have been as interesting? Well, it depends. You know, the, the big thing about therapy, unless you get one of those world-class therapists, as a patient, you have to be vulnerable. You have to be invested in it. Mm-hmm. And I, I think you have a great point that as as we age, we get more cynical, we get more set in our ways, and we get better at disguising what uh, what's going on with us. And so I think if if it had been mainline protectorate people and they didn't really want this, like Kidwin says, they could have just blown smoke up or behind. Mm-hmm for the whole hour and then be, you know, think and just skate on out. I think, you know, teenagers tend to, they're not practiced enough yet, usually in the disguising their emotions and being able to hide what's going on. And so I think that does make it more believable, maybe mm-hmm. as you're going through this, that these, that the folks would open up because it's like, yeah, there, there are these teenagers, as you said, we're, we're, living this double life in a post-apocalyptic world and thinking that they're getting the wrong end of the popsicle here. So mm-hmm. I think that's a great point that, that them all being teenagers makes it more believable. A little more You'd compelling. think there'd be more drawing it out if it was older people. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I think you're, more compelling is a good way to put it. it. We, we identify more with it. You know, it's like you think back to when you were, a teenager and mm-hmm. oh my gosh i i i ding the car door i'm gonna get killed when i get home this is the worst thing ever whereas you get to be our age and you open the door and you hit the concrete thing next to the light pole and you're like <laughs> ah well that's the third one oh well <laughs> you just walk on into target you know it's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah i'm just saying i hear it's like that i read a story about that one it's not yeah that it sure happened to me but. oh no of course not <laughs> are you kidding uh, so Jessica starts off with Victoria and then we get to meet Sveta. I don't know if she's the most unique case 53 we've come across. what do you think of Sveta? She was a trip. You know, it, it reminds me of the, like the strangler vines from, uh, minority report. Mm-hmm. And and they're you know they they show up in a lot of different stories, but that's where I I remember the uh, researcher trying to hold on to one and then it slicing her hand as it tried to get away and wrap around her and stuff. And so, but just the way uh, Sveta keeps saying, "Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry," and yeah. <laughs> Jessica's in the suit as rivets are popping loose and stuff. Dude, thinking, uh, I gotta stay calm. Yeah, well done, Miss Yamada. Mega props yeah. for for keep for keeping your your game face on in the in the face of getting constricted by this case fifty two. She's she's, I mean she's not trying to assault her. It's her power doing this for for whatever reason. Right. This girl, you know, kind of speaks to the messed up nature of what Cauldron was doing because. Mm. She was a regular human being once upon a time. Totally. And and she had aspirations and, and hopes. But yeah, these these folks are just using very poorly understood methods to try to create parahumans and just kind of like in in, in your line of work, well, some of it's gonna be scrap and we just chuck it, you know, and then and you're like, Well, no, but these are people. This isn't just a a hunk of metal that, you know, oh, yeah, no, we cut too deep on there. That's not going to work. So I think I would just be, I I don't know, if I if I had ended up this messed up, I don't know that I'd be able to to keep doing much of anything. Yeah. She's one of the other fascinating and tragic Mm. people inside this parahuman asylum. And we get a scene with Jessica doing what she does. She's trying to help 
Sveta learn to control her power enough to eventually be socialized mm. and, and possibly interact with additional patients. And clearly she's thinking of Victoria in that. So she's doing her job, helping her cope as best she can with the promise of possibly being able to interact with a, with another patient for, uh, I believe it was Christmas time. Good job, Jessica. Zveta, she just wants a friend. And Jessica's going to try to make that happen. Next up comes Clock Blocker. And I really enjoyed this. Did you see at this point, was it clear to you where in the sequence of events he is when he's sharing this information? Um, No, not exactly. I mean, I kind of kind of figure based on what he says about shadow stalker mm -hmm. you know that it's it's a ways down after that and you know probably some of the fallout with the teammates and stuff and and probably maybe right after he talked to skater and was kind of interrogating her or before kind of foreshadowing maybe what was going to happen but you we knew already from previous readings, whether it was previous in the actual timeline, mm -hmm. that he was pretty bent out of shape about the whole thing. And, and you know, he's, he makes some good points. Yeah, actually, in the sequence of events, this is immediately before the Undersiders come, before the mm -hmm. Noel thing comes to light. So gotcha. foreshadowing is the, the, uh, the way to look at it. And it was perfect, him, uh, Wild Bull, putting this here because it closed that loop because clock blocker was asking the same questions of himself with his therapist before he got in the van with skitter. Okay. I gotcha. And so, uh, yeah, he he's dealing with some stuff as you were saying. And I, I liked the, the way it was written. It really makes clock blocker. One of the more, um, three-dimensional really well um aside from being out you know not being an undersider i i, I really get a sense of this kid mm, yeah his troubles though i mean you want to uh expound on that um how do you think this kid's how's he coping he lays out all the stuff that's gone down the uh the death of his friends in the inbringer attack the issue with his father um and jessica's here to try to help him cope it's almost like he's a mirror image of Skitter, you know, like if Skitter had decided to join the wards. Mm. He's he's showing that it wasn't all rainbows and unicorns, you know, that there was he kind of had a thing for Shadow Stalker, even though she was a very unpleasant person. She he's he's a teenage guy. Right. And she was very athletic and, and well put together. So mm -hmm. And he's around her all the time. You know, I mean, it's one of those things. Well, you were in track. It's yeah, uh, no, you're I mean, that age and you're around the, the, the girls team all the time. You travel right. on buses together or whatever. And you're just like, oh, hey, you know, mm -hmm. and even if the person is, you know, you see them doing things, you're like, that was uncool. You're still like, well, yeah, but she she looks nice. <laughs> <laughs> and And so he's got these feelings. But then then all of a sudden stuff starts going sideways and you're like, wait, I thought I, I picked the right side on this. And mm -hmm. now we're looking kind of like the lamos, the the people who are ineffective here. And, you know, the bad guys are coming off like they're, they've got it together. And so it's got to be very discouraging for him. And just to top it all off about all the post-apocalyptic stuff we talked about, you know, sure. You're thinking that, oh, yeah, I'll get out of high school. I'll be part of the protectorate. I'll have a nice house. You know, I'll be successful. And then it's like, oh, yeah, the neighborhood I was going to live in is now under, you know, sewage on the east side of the town or whatever. So, yeah, it's got to be got to be very dispiriting. Yeah, and I mean, trying to work through it, but it's tough. Right. And the end bringers, I mean, hmm. parts of Japan are gone. Newfoundland is gone gone uh the place where behemoth first showed up is a radioactive wasteland as far as we know so mm. 
yeah, in the world at large, let alone Brockton Bay, you've just got to have this heaviness as a kid. Um, well, I guess not unlike what we as uh, young kids and teenagers toward the end of the, the Cold War felt with the the thought of Armageddon coming down upon our head in the form of a MERV. So, I mean, that's kind of the sense, just kind of talking through this and seeing this now, that's kind of the sense that I'm, I'm, I'm seeing from these wards. Yeah. And I think, I think you characterize that really well, especially as you're considering the far off stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, I can, I can remember uh, the doomsday clock and I can remember, I think in 80, Three, where it was like one minute to midnight again and mm-hmm. and it's just like holy toledo this i'm not even i'm not even out of college yet and this could just be the end this is not this is not fair you know one minute you're trying to crank out your homework or you're trying to figure out your weekend plans and then the next minute you know they're talking about oh yeah they're testing stuff over here you're like oh my gosh i can't yeah. believe that we're this close to mm-hmm yeah and to go back to region's comment from the previous thing it's like well it's only been a couple years why why are we getting all bent out of shape about this (laughs) yeah yeah uh what's that uh that uh wharf's brother said uh now's the time to celebrate for tomorrow we may all die uh during one of the star trek next gen okay but anyway uh so uh, sorry uh everyone we drifted a little far afield but <laughs> coming back to uh, to Jessica and her wards she moves on to Weld and um Weld is being a leader you know he's a little more put together than uh, than the others she's apparently after him to try to come up with a name a proper name for himself and she uh, Weld is there as a character it seems to just advance the timeline hmm. Not so much. Um, I don't get too much of an emotional feel from him on in, in any way, shape, or form. Did you? No, and and you know that's that's kind of what we touched on a little bit earlier. Teenagers in general are are not great at hiding their emotions, but some of them are. Mm-hmm. And depending on what what people have gone through, what they've experienced, they've realized whether it's some of them get really good at putting on the mask, you know, and, and it, it becomes almost attached, you know, that they can't take it off even when they're in a supposedly safe place, you know, they're just, yeah, it's just become uh, the, the habit. And so he just seems like one of those people that, you know, he says, well, oh, water off my back doesn't bother me. It's like, come on, that's got to bother you. Yeah. But he's just not willing to even, even think about it. Yeah, so um, probably rather than going one by one down this, uh, the remainders, um, pick out and discuss the remaining couple that you found the most interesting, I guess, is the ones that uh, you felt impacted the story or you you found the most compelling. Well, I, I liked Kid Wins because you can imagine that a tinker would be like this, and, and Jessica kind of touches on that, but he really does seem to have some kind of innate grasp of how things are working Mm -hmm. in his, in his personality or his spirit or whatever you want to call it, you know? And, and, and he's like, yeah, I just don't think this is, this is the way to go. And, and I, I tend to agree with them, you know, not every therapy isn't for everybody. Some people are able to just either come to grips with what they're at, or they just decide, that's too painful. I don't want to look at it. I'm just going to, I'm just going to move away from it. Mm-hmm. Now sweeping things under the rug isn't typically a good idea, but some people make it through life fine that way. So they may not experience the totality of all that life can provide, but they get through life. So I kind of like kid wins. And then I like vistas, you know, she had her usual chip on her shoulder <laughs> and, uh, you know, was trying to say, oh, well, you're just talking to me that way. Cause I'm 13 fine. You know? Right. But I think she really pointed out well that, hey, how can you even get what it's like 
when you go home to Boston, <laughs> you know, you're not, <laughs> you're not, you know, having the brown water come out of your faucet every day or trying to go to the store and there's nothing at the store or the store is not there. And so how can you even, and so I thought that was a great way that Wild Bo tries to really point out and, and hit home that, yeah, this is the latest disaster area and the people who are living in it, it's really hard to know what they're going through if you're not not there. Even if you're just mm-hmm. driving through, you still have your nice, cozy place to go home to, and you know that it's not devastated yet. So, Let's backtrack real briefly on the, the one with Flechette, where okay. uh, Jessica lamented the fact that a teenager just couldn't be vulnerable because of the situation. I mean, she's, she's a cape. She's, she's in the fight. Mm. And then um, the final part of Flechette's uh, section where Miss Militia calls back and Jessica answers the phone and says, uh, yes, I've seen half your wards today. They're not doing well. I know Miss Militia said they're losing faith. I know that depressed me (laughs) because (laughs) it, it, it felt so real, you know, these two sure. adults overseeing these kids and, and yeah, they know Miss Militia knows she, she's in the fight managing these kids. Not, not even remotely the same, but it's like I'm in the fourth, when I'm in the fourth quarter with my team, when I was coaching Pop Warner and if we're down by a touchdown and in my mind's eye, I know that they've got us, but I've, I've still got to try to keep my my mm. team motivated but i can see it in their eyes and i can't you know i can't let them see that in me so that that's what kind of sprung to my mind in this so that i think that's probably why it resonated with me that makes a lot of sense yeah it's uh i mean these kids they're kids and they've seen they know they go into danger but they didn't expect people to be dropping like flies and right right they've lost they've lost people to death to you know, mental breakdowns to going to the bird cage to extreme mutation, whatever you want to call it. And so it's just like, oh my gosh, yeah, this is, you know, you think about, I've never obviously, well, not obviously, I've never been in one of those like mass shooting situations, mm. but you know, I think it's, it's similar to that where I can remember how shocked I was when I was maybe in my twenties that I heard somebody I'd been in high school with had died. Sure. And, and I was just like, what? We're not even, we're barely out of high school. You know, how, mm-hmm. how did that happen already? And so to have all these folks around you just suffering these tragedies, I think even without this episode, you got to, the, the people kind of monitoring it must know that everybody's pretty shell shocked, mm-hmm. you know, because it's one thing to, get into it with, with the bad guys and, you know, bang, pow, smack, and then put some ice on it when you get back kind of thing. But it's a whole nother thing when people are gone forever. And like you said, yeah, they're, they're losing faith. Yeah. The final person that Miss Yamada talks to is Idolan. And this is where we get the totality of what his agenda actually is from from the time where he first showed up at the meeting hall, uh, the meeting conference room in uh, the PRT headquarters mm. and talked with Tattletail all the way past this to where uh, Skitter picks up him and Noel talking uh, bits and pieces using her bug sense, her, uh, her swarm sense to hear. This was it. This was the nugget. He's, he's reaching for something. He's trying to reclaim tap into a new, well of his power as he sees it and he's willing to to go go to the mat and and risk death to accomplish it that's his agenda and he's confiding in jessica and of course this is this is overwhelming to jessica this is the most powerful with the exception of scion this is the most powerful man on the planet yeah this is uh this is kind of a shocking one i mean she's Wild Bill paints Jessica that she's already pretty wrung out from this whole few days of going through these folks. 
she's there chain smoking on the roof with her feet dangling right. over the edge. That's <laughs> that's you know, if the, and another therapist came by, they'd be like, We need to talk. Why don't you <laughs> step into my office? I think something might be going on. And so, yeah, and then to have this dropped on her, it's like, wow, again, if I'm feeling like things are bad shape, mm -hmm. and then yeah, basically Superman's younger brother kind of shows up and says, wow, yeah, I'm, I'm losing my powers and I'm going to go see if I can get close enough to death that I get repowered. What? Yeah. So this has got to be, yeah, even more demoralizing to her. And, and she's just there as, oh, you can tell people what I was doing if it doesn't work out. It's like, oh, thanks. That's a great <laughs> honor. I'd love to be the person that just tells people that I knew you were going to try to push yourself to the brink of death and, Oh, you pushed a little too far. Right. Yeah. So uh, thanks for dropping that on me. <laughs> exactly. And that brings us to the end of the third interlude and we move on into chapter seven, which will be the final chapter we'll cover in this episode. And we pick back up with the team Skitter is trying to use her swarm sense to get a sense of what those guys, uh, what Noel and Idolin are discussing. Again, bits and pieces, and it's a struggle for her to do so. And uh, as we said in the last episode, we like that it's not just stereophonic sound and, and Skitter can make out 100% what's being said there. It adds a sense of uncertainty and and fear for me a little bit mm -hmm. that yeah what what exactly is being said here you know if i'm trying to fill in words is is eidolon trying to talk her out of it or is he trying to goad her into it or it, it's just yeah it's it's unsettling the way wild bow's written this and that's that's i think just what he was going for um to backtrack slightly to the, the previous interlude, when we get to the, the physical description of Eidolon, how'd you like that? I mean, you, I think it's fair to say when we think of a superpower, a uh, superpowered being, whether Marvel, DC, or here in Worm, um, I think we've it's fair to say, or we've been conditioned to expect that these are good looking people, people mm. who are physical specimens, be they male or female. And yet here we have what appears to be a description of a fairly average looking dude. <laughs> the most powerful with, again, with the exception of Scion, the most powerful person on the planet. And he's, he, you know, he's just an, an average guy. Did you find it an entertaining juxtaposition there? I hadn't really thought about it. Again, it made me think of Watchmen a little bit. Mm -hmm. And uh, the character, the Joker, I think. No, that wasn't his name. The comedian. Oh, comedian. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Where he's this big buff dude. But yeah, he takes off the mask and you're just kind of, whoa. Yeah, he's uh, he looks like he's the janitor or something. You know, he's just not not someone you would associate with superpowers. But as you're describing it, it makes me think, well, we've really seen kind of the two extremes with the the cauldron folks you know they're either they come out great or they come out nightmarish mm -hmm. and there's really i mean there's a few people that are okay well he doesn't sound bad bad but he's still way off the human norm and so maybe you know this is somebody that was a 90 percent or 90 percent success and it makes sense that there'd be that spectrum, you know, and we just haven't seen kind of the folks that fell in the middle yet. Okay. So, but as you're saying, it, I'm thinking, oh, well, maybe that's, it goes along with his, his power not being a hundred percent, you know, is that there was some little glitch, not a big one in his conversion, but there was a little bit of one. Mm -hmm. And his power set, the information that you've been given thus far. He, he's called, you could, I guess you could consider him the second most powerful person on the planet, but instead of making him completely invincible, Wild Bo has got this nice rule, I guess you could say, 
this limiting factor to keep him from being OP where he can only hold on to certain powers and it takes a while for each power to come up to full strength. Uh, did you find that effective to keep him from being just like uh, this superly overpowered guy who could just uh, look at you and you're dead? Yeah, I thought that was good. It was definitely more realistic for me that way. Mm -hmm. Kind of like in role playing games. You can kind of have one extreme where you never keep track of how much junk you're carrying with you or how much wear and tear your gear gets. Mm. Or you can go to the other extreme where, oh, your sandal strap broke in the middle of the battle. And so you <laughs> pulled a tendon. And so now you have to do that, you know, and it's just like, oh, my gosh. All right. That's so this is a, a happy medium, I think, where, all right, we're not going to let you just do anything and, and never have to consider any wear and tear. And I think, yeah, to your point, it helps it not be overpowered. It's something that there's got to be thought. There's got to be strategy. You can't just wade in and do whatever you want and come out unscathed. And I think during the battle, Wild Bo does a great job of kind of pointing that out, that you've got to try to find stuff that is going to be useful, but also could maybe have both an offensive and defensive component. Yeah, I, I, I find it very compelling to do it that way. It gets a little... Adds to the tension of the story. Exactly, yeah. There's always a chance that he picked the wrong group or he's going to be caught wrong-footed or something, you know, so... Yes, and uh, as, there, as the two of them are facing off, again, Grace is making the, the plea... You know, this is Idolan. He knows what he's doing. You undersiders are are looking to maneuver the situation in such a way that it meets your needs. Skitter's power is telling her that uh, about some of the additional minions that Noel has created. There's a leak nearby with a gun trying uh, getting ready to to ambush Idolan. Tattletales has Skitter draw arrows on the ground trying to ostensibly point to where Leet is. It's not till later that we figure out why that was. That was to guide Imp. That whole thing with Imp, Imp, she made a pretty dumb play. But I mean, well, I guess you could say it made sense to her for her reasoning. Huh, yeah. But uh, the, the scenario of her power usage, pretty well written. Suddenly, Imp is there. She slices the mutant Leet's throat. And then the next thing you know, Skitter is like, what? All of a sudden, this guy's bleeding out. What happened? Because mm. Imp's gone. And nobody <laughs> has any memory of her having been there, including Idolan. Uh, real effective in, in setting up the, the battle. Yeah. And, and it was interesting that they're both kind of stalling there and trying to mm -hmm. feel each other out. But they each have their machinations going on in the background. But yeah, the, the way Imp was written in here, I thought was really well done. You know, that they're just totally caught off guard. And then all of a sudden, everything starts flying around. It seems like Wild Bo has, is still in that groove from Arc 17, where, you know, we know that he spat out this thing, uh, Arc 17, those chap, what was it, a chapter a day or something, something insane. Mm. And he's he seems to in arc eighteen really maintain that level of not intensity, but uh what's the word I'm looking for? It just it seems to flow. And I think you yeah. even use that that word. It seems to that he seems to have continued that flow even into into this arc where it, it's it's almost seamless. The 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 action, the downtime has purpose. He builds up the tension again and then the action, uh, if that makes sense. Definitely. Yeah, I think that makes a lot of sense. And, you know, there's the little bit I played around with writing. You try to set up an outline kind of and you kind of know where you want it to start, maybe. And maybe you have an idea where you want it to go or end. And then you kind of say, well, what what could go in here? You know, what? what could happen here and uh you know maybe have a few ideas you reject a couple and 
but you lay out a few of these kind of story points, if you will, and then mm-hmm. you try to link them together. And sometimes, you know, it all falls into place. And you're just like, oh, yeah, cool. And then you're just, you know, jamming along and, right. and it almost kind of writes itself. You know, it gets a mind of its own a little bit. And and it that's this has that feel to it, you know, that it just mm-hmm. all started falling into place. Yeah, I definitely feel that, too. So the the battle begins, as you noted, it seemed like they were both stalling. Uh, we can kind of guess maybe maybe Noel is getting her, her minions in place and Eidolon is, is finally settled on his power set and is waiting for that to come up to full charge. And then boom. And I think Skitter used the phrase, uh, this was a battle between Titans. And mm. that was an apt description. Skitter goes into full to full mode here, as I said earlier. Uh, field commander Skitter, inner glory, marshalling the troops. Okay, we're going to go take out the clones. Okay, no, now we're going to go do this. We're going to try to rescue uh, any civilians and then take out the clones as well. During the confusion of, about how the leak died, Tattletail had panicked. You know, once the fight started, Leap was dead. Idolin's using his supercharged gravity, which was just an awesome weapon. Yeah. And Tattletail's freaked out because the building Leap was in, she was afraid that got hit. And that's when we discover that we sent Imp in there and everybody's freaked out about that. Yeah, it's... I mean, in past this great way that she can make an impact on the battle, but because of her power, it, it could result in you, you forget that she's there. Right. And, and then all of a sudden it's like she's right in the line of fire. So it's got to be a horrible feeling to just, oh my gosh, what do we do? Yeah. And the fortunately, for whatever reason, Tattletail's power allows her just enough to realize, oh, yeah, we did send her in there. Okay, that has to be a result of Imp's effort, whatever the the thing was. So everyone else, they could have, uh, Wild Bull doesn't write this in the story at that moment, but they could have had a whole conversation about saying, okay, we are going to send Imp into there. She turns her power on and poof. You know, she goes to, on the mission right. and nobody else even remembers. But fortunately, something in Tattletail's power holds on in, to enough to uh, remind her, okay, that's why that happened. That's why Leet's dead, because we sent him. And then she freaks out because she thinks the building that he's in, uh, that she's in, gets blown up by, what was it, the uh, power supply and the gun that Lee was firing. It hit the ground and then boom. Yeah, he, with his dying gesture, he grabs onto the gun and pulls it with him realizing uh what it's going to do and yeah the way wild bow writes it you know that even through her damaged eyesight mm. skitter could see the explosion it was that that bright and that large and then obviously the next thing you think is well that blew up right below the building where imp was mm-hmm. so then they gotta they gotta go try to figure out if she's okay and fortunately, she is. The team arrives. Skitter uses her bugs to sweep the building. They locate her. She's got a ruptured eardrum, and she's covered in, in grunge and plaster. But other than that, she's got some bruises, and she's okay. Idolin's doing something weird. So Skitter's trying to tag him with bugs just to keep track of the battle, know where yeah. the combatants are. And every now and again, he swipes himself with that supercharged gravity and skitter can't figure out what that means it's not till later that maybe we get an idea of what what it was he was trying to convey to her i guess noel attacks a building swallows up some uh, civilians vomits out a bunch bunch of clones the clones start attacking the people they were created from definitely one of the more gruesome descriptions no doubt yeah it's totally like a zombie movie at that point you're just like dang now 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 they're coming for me you know it's just that's grim yes and at one point when uh skitter's using her powers to watch what what's coming out of noel at one point 
she sees Vista, the Vista. And from inside one of the mouths of Noel's lower body, a tongue or some kind of appendage comes out, grabs Vista and swallows her back inside of uh, Noel's lower body. Mm. And that's another terrifying thought. She tells the team this and then Tattletail freaks out because she's like, oh my God, she's keeping that. That's how she's able to keep or pardon me, produce more clones. She's keeping the primary inside her body. We can't kill her without killing her victims. Yeah. So it's the ultimate hostage situation. That's yeah, just another a layer of nightmarish nightmarishness added on here. And this goes back to Noel when she was human fully. We know she had some we speculated on her eating disorder. Oh Do you yeah. Read anything into that? Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. You know, it definitely could be a parallel there. Anorexia or bulimia, one or both, you know, this, this poor girl, she had it rough and she, I guess, ultimately we, she's the tool that the Seamer needed for whatever reason. Right. And then there's the other side of it too, where we talked about because she was so damaged physically when they gave her the half dose. Right. Is how much of it is coming from that too? You know that uh, she was already struggling mentally with her feelings about food and weight and that kind of thing, and then physically, all of a sudden, she's not able to process stuff or eliminate stuff, and so it's kind of this double whammy that's turned into this huge, disgusting clone making machine. Yeah. So as we're heading heading toward the end of the chapter. The team is trying to rescue civilians, trying to take out clones. And Skitter makes a discovery. At first, she discovers a rat that is climbing out of this uh, bile, this uh, stuff that uh, Mm. that Noelle is ejecting every every time she creates a clone. And this rat appears to be a clone. She finds a few more and she has her insects or swarm take out the rats. And then as we're moving to the very end of the of the chapter, that's where Skitter discovers additional bugs are crawling out of this slurry, this flesh slurry. And she can't control them. She can't feel them with her power. And these things are beginning to take out her bugs and attack the innocent people in the area. From bad to worse. Right, yeah. She's turning skitter's strength against her you know she's got and and now we finally figure out well that's probably why eidolon was trying to keep stuff off him because he he couldn't know if they were good bugs or bug clones that were who was controlling the bugs she's creating all these different types of minions and as you said it's going to be swarm versus swarm Some of these minions have intelligences behind them, have an intelligence behind them. And some of them are just four-legged critters. And some of them are flying and uh, crawling critters. This horrible creation that is Noel with this, this intelligence, this team leader, this former gamer intelligence, this is going to be quite the uh, challenge for, for Skitter and the rest of the undersiders. Yeah, it's going to be, it's a little like what uh, happened with the Slaughterhouse Nine. They're not going to know who is, it's not going to be instantly apparent who's under control of whom or what's under control of whom. And mm-hmm. so, um, and, and there's just going to be way more combatants on the field of battle than they expected. Yeah. And that's it for the chapter. Any final thoughts on uh, on this section that we covered tonight? Well, I think we kind of summed it up there at the end, you know, that it's a little like that scene from the second Matrix movie, you know, where the agent steps out and then a clone of the agent steps out. And then next thing you know, they're pouring out of every door and around every building. And it's yeah. just, and you're like, holy Toledo, what? 
there's no way out. You know, you're going to, there's no way this could turn out well. And eventually, you know, as it's almost like a tug of war on who's going to be able, who's going to be able to control the swarm, at least on the bug side. And Skidder's really been deploying them as her eyes, and she's not going to be able to do that as well. She's going to have to hold them back so they don't get taken over. Right. So it's, this is looking really bad. <laughs> to, <laughs> wow, to that say was, the... Yeah, thank you, Captain Obvious. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. All right, folks, as I said, this is the end of part three. In part four, we'll review the remaining chapters of the arc, and Andy will make his selection for key character of the arc. The intensity continues to ratchet up, and don't forget that we'll be having Tony, my stepson, join us, our resident worm expert. He'll be joining us for part four as we close out arc 18. We hope you join us for that. So until next time, take care. Yeah, that'll definitely be uh, one episode you don't want to miss. Tony, once again, will support my every effort to extract any kind of clues as to what's coming and artfully dodge all of my questions and basically make me look like a goofball. But I'm sure you'll all <laughs> really enjoy that. So uh, looking forward to next episode and hope you're there as well. Thanks so much. Thanks for joining us in this podcast. We hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe. If not, thanks for stopping by anyway, and we'll hope you'll return. Music is by the band Why Why Not from their self-titled debut CD. You can find more in the link down below. Catch you later. <laughs>